right, thank you everyone for coming tonight. This is uh, a fun topic to talk about licensing your artwork. Uh, the subtitle is How to Make Money While Sleeping. So, um, wouldn't that be nice? So we have a number of artists here, we have a number of photographers here, and um, all those creative works have the potential for licensing. I'm going to go over that a bit, and we're going to go over where those uh, images can be used on products, what types of products. Um, I'm going to go over some of my licensing agreements that I have and show you where I appear um, and on different places on the internet and how that works. And uh, I actually have a, a licensing agreement here that I've spent a lot of time on and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. And at the end, if there are any questions, we're happy to go over that. And as Kate mentioned, we can also give you a tour of our facility here. We do a lot of printing for artists um, so that they can uh, and once you paint something and you sell the original, that's done unless you make reproductions of that. So that's one of the things that we do here. We specialize in it and take great pride in having um, you know, some of the best quality that you can get in terms of clay reproduction. Uh, last month's seminar, we talked about the clays and what that term means and, and how we go about making the reproductions and how to prepare your artwork for that. And we'll probably be giving that seminar again um, soon if you're interested. Just let us know and we'll set a date on that. Sponsored by Manol Art Printing, once again. And we'll, we'll sit down with you if you want to bring in files and we can look at them on the computer and go over them with you and give our, do our suggestions and help you prepare them for printing. Where is artwork or photography licensed and used? Well, a lot of places. If you've ever been in a hotel, all those images on the walls, those are licensed from some artist and reproduced and put in every hotel room. That's a huge market. I have um, a number of my pieces in hotel rooms. T-shirts. Some of these T-shirts are really, really interesting and fun these days. Uh, they don't just print a little square on the front, you know, wraps around the whole thing. Uh, and the technology here today uh, makes that much easier to do. They have what's called uh, direct-to-garment printing. They actually have printing machines that print right on the fabric. You can print on the T-shirt uh, after it's made or before it's made, and then it can be sewn into a T-shirt. So that's a very exciting development for artists yeah. is direct to garment <coughs> printing. Coffee mugs, labels, all kinds. Um, everywhere you look, you go in the store, you can see artwork and photographs used in uh, uh, sale and promotion of products. Pillow and blankets. This is a, an old um, mm -hmm. image from World War II that everyone's familiar with. And uh, I took a closer mm -hmm. look at this at Bed Bath & Beyond. And um, this is an original photograph. I could tell by looking at the, uh, the other details in the scene. And we now have the technology to actually convert the image into different colored threads sewn in enough, tight enough weave to show, show the artwork. And I'm familiar with uh, one company in particular that does that. Um, and so here we have a pillow that's sewn with the threads which reproduce the artwork, and here we have like a, a blanket, a throw, with the same image on it. So that's exciting for us artists. It's just not uh, a simple silkscreen process anymore. It's a digital print, which can be done from any file and printed on demand from these big companies who have the equipment to do that. So it's a very exciting time. I actually have a sample here. Now this isn't the uh, the print to man demand, but this is uh, dye sublimation printing, a piece of my artwork on fabric. And um, in this dye sublimation process, what they do is they have a, an inkjet printer which prints on a transfer paper, and then they put the transfer paper in a big heat press and put it down on the fabric, and the heat makes the, uh, the dyes gaseous and they transfer into the fabric. And that can be done uh, not very expensively, and this could be made into a pillow or any variety of things, and it's uh, permanent. So I'll pass this around, you can take a look at it. Yeah. Scott, if you had a photograph, would you, for this process, would you still be using 300 resolution, or do you have to go better than that? Uh, 300 is sufficient. Okay. Sometimes you don't even need that much. They have some odd numbers, like 216 or, or something. But yeah, you talk to the printer that's producing and he'll tell you what he needs. Okay, but 300 is generally the max. Generally, that's, that's fine, yeah. Okay. All right, so shower curtains. 
Mm. Wow, that's cool. Let's find that at your Walmart. Put them in for artwork on the shower curtain. How cool is that? <laughs> Designer pillows. Photo pillows. So uh, nice, yeah. I actually saw these in uh, Bed Bath and Beyond. I just photographed them Monday night. Mm, wow. And I went there specifically looking. Do they have photo pillows yet? You know, in the general marketplace, and they they do. Wow. They had two or three of them, but that was that was it. But that's a whole growing market using your photograph or your artwork that's been photographed, having the digital file, and sending it to a company that can print on the fabric and make products. Uh, this company I've been in touch with in South Carolina, and they have a huge facility, and they can do, uh, I think, up to like 10 feet wide. And they can do duvet covers and all kinds of things with your digital file, if you have a large enough file. So it's a very exciting time, as I said. Sheet sets. <laughs> Dubai and sheets. This is um, <coughs> photo based, and I saw this in Bed Bath and Beyond. You know, I looked at it closely. You can't really read the type, but it was obviously uh, from a uh, photograph. Oh, I love yeah. that. So the possibilities are endless. It's a very exciting time to be an artist with the new technologies available. How did they get that so big? Um, well, they have huge printers, and they can print them that large. Just but they're taking some, it from a smaller photo. How do they keep the um, resolution? Well, resolution thank you. Um, Could be high, high I don't. I don't think this is a, uh, a photograph particularly, but it's probably been photographed and digitized with a really high end, uh, high resolution scanning back camera that can produce like 500 megabyte files. Wow. I want one of those. So with a photograph, you probably have some limitations on how big you can go, but uh, you can still go pretty big. I mean, people aren't going to look at that with a loop, you know, and criticize you for not being really sharp, like they do with an 8x10 glossy print. Right. You know? So why do companies license artwork? Well, the goal is to enhance the look of a product. They're looking to sell the products and make it more interesting and inviting for people to buy them. Um, and everyday items are used, like it says, dish towels, gift wrap, stationery, textiles, apparel, paper goods, and more. And it makes the product more irresistible to the consumer, who then buys the product. And then the retailer, the manufacturer, and the artist uh, create income from that. So there are a couple aspects of this, license or assign. And when you assign it, you're actually like selling the rights to the image to the manufacturer to use. And I've seen that with some um, um, puzzles. I mean, I used to, when I was a commercial photographer in Boston, I used to do photography for this puzzle manufacturer, and I got to know them. And, and what they did was they would pay the photographer $850 for the image, and then they had unlimited rights to it, and they actually owned the copyright of it. So that's called a sign. And you're assigning them the, uh, the rights to the image. And the other uh, way to do it is licensing it where it's like, uh, like it says, it's like renting your home. Instead of selling your home, you're renting your home, and you transfer the rights temporarily, but you retain the ownership of the piece. You own the copyright. In the assigning, then, can you not use that image? You've given, basically, you've sold the image. Most likely, Most yeah. Likely they own the copyright, so then right. you'd have so to get permission from them yeah, to use exactly. it. Exactly. Okay. See? Yeah. It all depends upon your agreements. We're going to talk about agreements a little right. bit today. Okay. So, I mean, anything can happen, but you have to have it in writing right. and worked out in advance. Yeah. And the worst thing you can do is just sign their general contract without knowing what it is. And unfortunately, a lot of artists do that. They just sign away, and sometimes they're signing away their rights, and they don't even know it. They just make assumptions that, you know, it's a certain type of licensing agreement, and it may or may not be. Yeah. So, if you're really serious about this, you need to learn about it, you know, and hire a lawyer probably, and, you know, really get into it. Okay, good. Is there another question? Yeah. Is there one of these that is used or favored more often, the assignment or the license with that it seems to be preferred? Well, usually what happens is um, the manufacturer has a standard agreement, and what happens is you'll get it, and a lot of artists just sign it off, but you should read it and understand it. If there's anything that you disagree with, um, you can change it and submit it back to them and have them change it before you sign it. So in other words, it's going to depend on who you deal with, basically. Yeah, exactly. A lot of them have their standard forms, but I had one and I spent six months negotiating it. And I rewrote most of it and I spent tons of money with a lawyer doing it. And we'll go over that in a little bit. 
Okay, so there are two approaches to this, uh, doing a license or assigning the rights. So we want to talk more about licensing, because um, that's a little more interesting and complex than just getting paid you know, a flat sum of money and being done with it. Okay, so the verb license or grant license means to give permission. The noun license refers to that permission as well as the document recording that permission. And the license is granted, and you have all legal terms, licensor, licensee, and it's a, an agreement. And so you're giving them authorization to use that licensed material. You're the licensor, and they're the licensee. So stock photography is one example of using uh, licensing as a tool of getting money and having them be able to have the rights to use your images. And uh, they have um, a standard document typically. This is one example, I stock photo. Um, 20 years ago, photographers used to make a lot more money off of these. They um, license an image to uh, a manufacturer or to an advertising firm for like $300 or something like that. But now you can get on the internet and get these images for like $5 and $3. So the price has come way down. But the other upswing of that is that uh, with these websites, you get a global audience for them, and instead of having a few hundred people amazing you, maybe using your image, you might have thousands or tens of thousands of people buying it, the rights to use it for like a brochure or an ad or something for you know five, ten dollars or twenty-five dollars. But um, you know, if, if you're getting like a, a dollar or five dollars per use, and they're using, you know, it gets used like twenty thousand times. I mean, that adds up to some serious money. So iStock Photo is one of the most popular ones, and we use that sometimes for our projects with clients where we're, we're promoting, uh, promoting them. Uh, here's another one, Shutterstock, and there are dozens of them out there, and uh, you can do your own Google search and find them. <coughs> and, uh, one thing I've thought about doing, this is a, a good tip for the photographers, I thought about this, but I haven't had time to do it, is on these sites, they often tell you how many times it's been purchased. And so you can look at like something that's been highly purchased, like for example the uh, the standard shot of looking at a conference table with a few people sitting around it. That's used over and over again in all the brochures and annual reports and things like that. So you could find one of those images that's used over and over again, and maybe create a variation of that because all those people who license that image are tired of that same image. They want something new that they can use. So you could play off of that and make one that's kind of similar. Uh, and probably make a killing. <laughs> we were talking about stock photography one day in uh -huh. a meeting, and uh, a couple of guys said that they were turned down by my stock. Mm -hmm. and I think other stock as well because their images didn't meet their quality. Right. You know anything about their qual you know, what qualifies for them? What do they look at? Yeah, I'm sure that there are some um, mechanical, physical requirements, like so many DPI, and that it can go so large, and there are probably some aesthetic uh, uh, guidelines as well. And, you know, they're looking for things that are going to sell. I mean, in all of this, licensing and everything, they're looking to make money. They want something that's going to sell, and if they look at your stuff and they don't think they have the market for it, they're not going to be so interested. And it's not that that work is bad, it's just that they know what's selling, like right now, in today's market. You know, and, and we'll get the end of that a little bit later, but like the, the colors for 2013 uh, are a certain standard set of colors and they're more likely to sell than some other, something that looks like it's from the 70s, you know. Yes? I understand that don't take their rejection serious the first time. Right. Resubmit, they may buy it. That's true. That's true. And you can try some other stock houses or, or wait a year or two and you know, they may be looking for something else, and all of a sudden, <coughs> you've got something that they're looking for. They weren't looking for it last year, but now they're looking for it today. Perhaps a different editor. Since. Or a different editor, yeah. They change, and it's very uh, personal, their decisions. I find that in uh, competitions and judge <coughs> art festivals, it's, the judges are very, very much operating off of a personal taste level. 
So if you want to be successful, it's a good idea to learn what their tastes are so that you can present something that's more likely to be within what they would uh, get excited about or be interested in. Yeah? Do these sites uh, have a thing of what they're looking for? Like um, what type of artwork? Sometimes, but sometimes not. Okay. And sometimes you can call them and sometimes they'll tell you. And I would, if you're serious about it, I would, I would do that. I had a friend who uh, was interested in getting his website, you know, get a higher ranking in, in Google, and he called Google, and he got all the inside scoop on what they're, how they rank sites. And not many people think of doing that, but you can oftentimes call them and get that information and get a leg up on everybody else. There's, there's books uh, on that as well. Yeah. If you look for Google hacking, uh -huh. you know, how to get your, uh, <laughs> your ranking higher, depending on who you're affiliated with and such. Yeah, yeah, the number of things you can do, and uh, but you have to kind of keep up to date on that because they can change. It's all about they... to change again. Google's... Yeah, because <laughs> they're changing it again June 1st. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they'll, they'll discover that people are jumping on the bandwagon of you know, increasing their rankings, and then they realize, oh, that's not such a good idea, and they'll change the rules again. And you kind of have to keep up with it. <coughs> Yes. Are there a, excuse me? Are there agents that they would prefer to work with, or are they receptive to individuals uh, contacting them regarding their work? Like, for example, with a, a lot of books uh, for authors, uh, many of the, the more notable houses won't talk to you; they'll only deal through an agent. Yeah, that's true. But I would say that there are no hard, fast rules in this day and age. So it's pretty much a wide open field. Yeah, things are always changing in this day and age. It's, it's, it's <coughs> funny. You know? I mean, as an artist, you used to depend upon the galleries almost entirely, but now that's changed. You know, people are more self-representing themselves and doing other avenues. And I'm sure that's true with every other industry. You know, it used to be only agents. You know, could get the communication into the right person. Yeah. You know? But um, it depends. Say that's one hard fast rule at all. Yeah. Scott, I'm curious to know if anybody in here sold uh, photography through stock houses. <coughs> Has anybody sold <coughs> photography to stock houses? I have. Why don't you share, share with us what you've experienced? Yeah. Well, I think a good way to get accepted, and some of it's monkey see, monkey do, but like deposit photos since you're in Florida and they're a fairly new house, maybe they're about a year or so old, so they're trying to build uh, their corral, and yeah, I think you're likely to get accepted there quickly. Oh, is that photo? Deposit photos. They all have their stuff online, but almost all of them say that don't call us and ask us what we want, because some people want to interpret that as an assignment, no one's giving an assignment. Yet. And some houses, um, uh, like any of the Getty companies, they want ex your images exclusively. Where other yeah, houses right. like Deposit Photos or Press Stock, Comstock, a lot of the older ones, you can list them there and everywhere else. Um, and sometimes there's an advantage to that also. How many are you up with? Two. Which ones? Uh, Some... Deposit Photos oh, yeah. and uh, I. Uh, Stop, I stop oh, okay. Because I know there's a lot of stuff on YouTube about that too, to learn a lot about I stuff, stop, I stop. Well, right? I take it off of deposit photos. I'm sorry, Crest Stock. Why did I say deposit photos? Crest Stock. I take it off of Crest Stock if, I, if Getty will take it. Because it's much more money yeah. rights managed than yeah. royalty free. Crest Stock. OCK, yes. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So this is a, a company that I have a relationship with called Great American Art, and they're in Boston. And uh, Jerry and I are friends with the owner, and I have an arrangement with them, and they've got a lot of my images on their website. Um, and we have um, a little bit different arrangement because we also print G plays. So what they'll do is they'll get an order, someone will go on their website, they'll see one of my pieces, and they'll buy it on the website, and then we get the order from Great American, and we produce it here, and then we ship it, and we ship it blind, which means that we don't have our name on it. They've um, gotten me in a few hotels, you know, where they'll run off 200 of them, and they'll go in hotel rooms. 
This one's called Abby, A B B E Y Art. So they act as image brokers? Yeah. Okay. Well, what Abby does is they'll sell a hotel deal and uh, they have my images on their hard drive and then they'll print all 200 of them on canvas and then go in and install them. So they'll handle the whole They're thing and then I get my commission check every six months. On all 200? Yes. Anybody want to answer the question? You've had some experience. No, it doesn't mean that. It means you can buy it royalty free for a nominal amount of money and not have to pay royalties each time you print it on your stationery or t shirts or whatever. So you mean they pay a one time fee to the company and the company pays? <coughs> a, con a, a consumer would, yes, but you as a photographer would get paid each time it's downloaded. It's not a lot of money, it's like 30 cents or maybe a dollar. Or whatever and you know you've seen a lot of those photos already I mean they're showing up on television ads now they're showing up in brochures and websites all over the place it's always the same 200 photos you see again and again and again and again so or like the girl with the headset on the phone answering right, yeah. you see the same right. photos yeah right now she's the too when a consumer buys that <coughs> Well, that would be rights managed. Right -handed, yeah. yeah, but royalty free, you can get them for three dollars. Right. A lot of you know, you pay maybe some, a lot of them now call them credit. So it's like a 72 DPI might be one credit, a 96 DPI, 150 DPI, whatever, 300 DPI, high res, bigger, 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 might be nine dollars, and you make more money the larger the file someone buys. You get a piece of the action. It's usually about 30%, 25% most of the stock houses for royalty free. You, you, have, you have to be careful, but you also uh, have to understand that there is risk and you are going to have some uh, uh, incidents every now and then. I, I knew a woman at an outdoor art festival and she was, had some very creative um, garden artwork, you know, like turtles on a stick or something, and then the next year she saw it in a, a catalog. You know, and, and someone had come and photographed it and had it manufactured in China, and it's essentially her piece now in a catalog. And she's not getting any benefit from that, so they kind of ripped her off. Um, you just have to understand that that happens, and there's not a lot you can do about it. So you can decide that you're going to, you know, huddle down and have a shell and, and not get ripped off, or put yourself out there and hopefully that you'll win more often than you'll lose. Yeah. Is there a way to track that? I mean. Once you sell to someone, I've, I've actually seen uh, an article online. You, you can Google it, where they say how to track your photography, mm -hmm. and they actually look at the image, and Google or these crawlers will go out looking for things like that. Hmm. Now there's a Google image search, and you yeah. can put your image in the Google that box on the web page, and it'll find everywhere else in the world where it appears. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Huh. The uh, June issue of Shutterbug has a whole thing about copyrights, kind of copyright, murder, and stuff, that kind of stuff. Uh huh. Huh. Anyway, you get something about the register for the copyright, then right. you can do the $100,000 for it. Right, now that's a very good point. You know, should I copyright or not? Now, according to the law, I think it was 1987, <coughs> as soon as you produce an artwork, it's automatically copyrighted. However, if you want to take someone to task on it and go to uh, take them to court, then you have a much stronger position if you have it officially copyrighted. Uh, if you don't have a copyright, you might have a fine, hard time finding a lawyer to represent you and, and take it up and go to court. You know, if you have it officially copyrighted, then um, you have those um, hundred thousand dollar punitive fines and it can add up to serious money. So. If, uh, if you're really out there and doing it in a, in a big way and you're serious about it and you want to protect yourself, it's worth it to get a copyright. And it isn't that hard or that expensive to do it. So you have no, I was going to say, it's, if you go like <laughs> you know, the LC, it's only $30. You, you take all your images to a JPEG, yeah. low res, and put them into a PDF. So you have one PDF and you can upload that online. And if you do it online, it's $30. But
Can you repeat that site? EGOV, that's it? Yeah, I forget the exact wording, but it says something to the effect that that right is copyrighted or any parts thereof. So if you have a multiple page PDF, each one is a part thereof. So the whole uh, library of images is um, protected in one fell swoop. So um, this is a company in Boston. They've already changed names once. I have an agreement with them. And it's similar to the other one, like the Great American, where they'll send me the order, and then I'll fulfill the order and send it to the end client. Um, Blind, meaning it's his art fulfillment center on it. Well, is that then sold on an each basis, or is the triptych sold as a, as a unit? The triptych is sold as one piece, okay. and they've got a mark here for $1,782. Wow. And they've marked it up and jacked up the price of it. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> now, the interesting with this Wayfair site is they also have other affiliates that I didn't know about. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> And it shocked me, and I don't know if it was good or bad, but then I said, okay, well, I'm getting more exposure, and if they order through this other website, it's going to go through Wafer, and it's going to come back to me. So this is where it appeared, on Amazon. <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> For $29.70. So but you don't. It up even more. That's the same size piece. And you don't get a percentage of that, right? It's I get my fixed price that your I've fixed negotiated price. with Wayfair. Right. I haven't approached them. I, I never really consider putting on Amazon or some of these other websites. I kind of think that my artwork is a little bit special and I'm going after a more higher end market. I wouldn't put it on some of these other websites. Yeah, that, that can definitely happen. Now, um, up until now, I haven't put prices on my own website because I have all these relationships going on, and I work with interior designers, and you know, I had a gallery in Key West that had my artwork, and they were tripling my price. So um, up until recently, I've been had the attitude, well, I shouldn't have a price on my website because I don't want people to discover that you know, they're being ripped off or paying more than they should. Um, but I'm going to, my next revision of my website, I'm going to have prices on it. But it gives you a chance to create a retail card and a wholesale, wholesale. card and then a trade card for your designers. Right, right. But it gives you a chance to make triple the money that you on retail. Yeah, so up until recently, I wasn't convinced that someone would spend two or three thousand dollars for a piece of artwork on the little JPEG that they saw on the internet. Okay, and for many years I said, okay, that's, that's just not going to happen. I wouldn't do it. But it's starting to happen. <laughs> I'm getting more orders from, from Wayfair and from other companies. And so now I'm thinking, well, maybe I should have prices on. I'm, I could be losing business by not having it, the prices on there. And some people, they, they're shopping on the internet. I'm Myself, if I don't see a price, I may not bother to ask what the price is. You right. think it's probably too high. Or yep. you know, you're just kind of browsing and you wouldn't even... You're right. Take the time to do it. But now I'm rethinking all that because I am selling pieces over a thousand dollars off a little JPEG. Yeah, you're right. Well, Most people won't won't buy it without the price. Would you then price the same as theirs? Or yeah. Or how, how would you decide what the price is? Well, I have my prices set based upon you know my uh, my business model here, having the studio and the gallery and doing outdoor art festivals, and I have a history my clients and prices that I've sold to them. So I would I would maintain those prices which are a lot less than this. Okay, so so then wouldn't Amazon be more than a little ticked off at you? It's his artwork. <laughs> it's, it's not Amazon. Yeah. No. Oh, well, that's Wayfair. Maybe Mayfair. Plus, yeah, Wayfair is doing it and then Amazon's jacking up the price. Oh so again. it's Wayfair that okay. Yeah but if so Wayfair's have, jacked it up and then Amazon's probably jacked it up even further. Yeah. No Amazon doesn't jack. You know? <laughs> now, Wayfair pays Amazon. Amazon holds the fee. So when that deal goes through at 29, mm -hmm. they'll send Wayfair a percentage. Yeah, I guess Amazon's not fulfilling it. They're just. They get a percentage for posting it. The name is there, so a savvy shopper would probably right. go and I Google would do that. it. I would do 
Yeah, yeah I've yeah, had that on numerous occasions. And if you if you Google, cut and paste the top line there, you know, you go to Google Shopping, right. and you can actually see multiple versions of the same item for say, and you can see one's twenty nine and one's fifteen hundred. Oh well, verify they're the same item, and you can go either way. Right. Plus the price is in the the eyes of the beholder. I mean. You yeah. know, I would spend 500 on one thing when somebody else might spend 3000 on it, so that shouldn't matter. Yeah. If Some it, people are so wealthy, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Just, yeah. Right. Shouldn't but, be a concern. Uh, lately, I've been selling the same thing for about $985 at our festivals. So doesn't that discredit Wayfair or whatever that company is because their price is so much higher that they don't care? Well, people don't do no. the research. Yeah. Okay, good. They have a different marketing plan than you have. Yeah. yeah. That's true. <laughs> And if you're a shopper, you're going to go to the cheapest one. If you're an art lover, you're you're going to pay whatever you think it's worth. And for right. me, I have to have a price where I'm I can sell it regularly. Mm -hmm. They can jack it up, and if it doesn't sell, True. it's not a big deal to them. But to yeah. me, if I have too high a price, yeah. I had that happen with um, when I was doing that gallery in uh, in uh, Key West. I had a salesperson working for me, and we had them, and they said, "Oh, your prices are too low. You should triple your prices." You know. Okay, I'll triple my prices. And then my sales went to zero for like two months. Yeah, two. Pricing is very I just priced myself out of the market that I'm currently, you know, servicing and dealing with. And that's not to say if I went to a different marketplace, a higher marketplace, I could, you know, get those prices. But the currently the people I'm able to contact and run into, those prices are too high. So I brought my prices back down to a more reasonable level and now I'm having continuing sales again. But there's no skin off their back if they price it up and they don't get any sales. <coughs> Probably good to serve. Right. And I do have a wholesale price list and a retail price list. And I do have uh, certain arrangements with certain people on the, on the pricing. So, I mean, there, there is a lot to it. It's kind of complicated, but you've got to, you know, sit out and work it out. And you'll make mistakes, but, you know, you learn over time and figure out what works for you and what works for your your clientele and your, your people who enjoy your artwork. And, and isn't that a constantly changing, changing flex state where, I mean, yeah. You know, depending on which way the wind is blowing, it can affect you. Yeah, totally. I wish it were easier, but uh, it isn't. You have to do your research, and you have to understand the agreements, and what you're agreeing to, and what the expectations are. So it also appeared on Sears. <laughs> oh my gosh. Sears. And it's also on Walmart. Wow. So uh, I was kind of shocked when I first saw that, but then it's like, okay, well, you're doing the work for you. Do I want to put in my agreement that they're not allowed to, you know, put on other websites? So it's kind of a, a rough issue. But I don't think of uh, you know the Walmart buyers being my for my artwork. Yeah, it's true. I think it kind of degrades it a bit. But At least the prices are high. Yeah, yeah. But I'm, on the other hand, I'm getting more exposure. More people are seeing me. And then when you you Google my name, Scott Chamin, all I get like 50 pages of links to all kinds of That's sites true. like this. So it kind of lets my credibility at all. It's right. all everywhere. It's unbelievable. Yeah. So he must be really famous. Yeah. They're willing to pay that price. Work isn't good. He must be famous. <laughs> So here's um, another arrangement I have with a company called Motor Rouge in uh, Australia. I did a show at the, at the decor show in Atlanta a number of years ago, and this guy comes up and he's very excited about my artwork. He wants to represent me in Australia. He's got this art company, <coughs> and uh, this is the one where I uh, <coughs> I have a, a big agreement with. Oh, wow. So um, so here here I am here be great for sheets. And there's a whole bunch yes. of them. Mm -hmm. So he contacted me and he was very excited about it and um, I was a little bit worried about Australia and losing control of my artwork and 
not knowing how to make an international agreement. So um, I didn't call him back. And he called me back a month later. Hey, you know, what do you think? Blah, blah, blah. And I said, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Maybe I'll talk to a lawyer about it. You know, I kind of forgot about it. And he calls back again. And he keeps calling again and again and again. So he's like really seriously interested in the artwork. So I figured, okay, well, you know, maybe I should do something about this. If I don't, you know, I could be losing out. You know, I better follow up on this and, and do my homework and do it right. So, uh, so where do I go to find a lawyer who knows about international, you know, copyright and how to make an agreement? So, uh, my, my brother-in-law lives in Cincinnati, and he knew the lawyers who did the agreements for Dilbert Cartoons, you know, and licensing oh, wow. all around the world. So we figured, okay, we'll give them a call. And we'll see if they're available to help us with this agreement. So Motor Rouge gives us their agreement. And we're reading through it. Oh, this is terrible. Oh, man, man. I don't like this at all. This is oppressive, you know. So we sent her off to our new lawyers in Cincinnati. And they went through it. And we are on the phone again and again and again. And we're crossing lines out, you know, and rewriting it and going through it. We spent six months rewriting this agreement. Wow. And... You know, it's it's ridiculous. <laughs> There's the first page of the table of contents. There's the second page of the table of contents. And they go into defining what an agreement is. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> they go in, they go into defining what a business day is. They define what a confidential information means. Wow. They define what a dispute means. They define what a dispute notice means. They define what gross earnings mean. Everything is defined in this, this definitions of page, definition page. So it just goes on and on and on, and it's like, man, I just want to create artwork. This one. Now you signed up with Motor Rouge. Yeah. It's an Australian. So if they did the same thing, and it goes around in Australia, like you say, goes around in Europe, mm -hmm. how easy is it for you to even keep track of that? contract and see if it's being honored or broken or well they you know, do not have what any you deserve from the sales of the, of the images in this instance they don't have any of my high-res files they've got some good size web page files but they don't have enough to reproduce mm -hmm. and they could do a five by seven inch or maybe even stretching it to an eight by ten but they can't do a full canvas with the files that I provided them they have to come to me. To so based right upon that, I don't believe I'm being ripped off. Is that the same kind of thing we should do with other photography? For example, I'm trying to get into like band photography. Mm -hmm. So license a given photo, or portrait or whatever, for you know, six months or something. Give them low res files in the beginning and then they come back to me for... Yeah, that's what I re recommend. Give them enough so that they can represent it put on their website and have it represent it well enough that someone who's interested in buying it can actually see enough to make a decision. <laughs> but uh, about once a month, I Google my name to see where I appear on the internet. And it's very <laughs> interesting. But yeah, once a month, I, I really do that. I search my name and see where I'm appearing, just for this purpose. <coughs> All right, so I did some research on the internet, and this is what some lawyers say you should do. This is kind of like the, the ideal uh, recommendations, but you can't always do this because they usually give you an agreement and they expect you to sign it and you can modify it. But if you were writing it or if you wanted to modify their agreement, these are some of the things that you would be thinking about. You'd always want to make sure that your license includes the names of the specific works that you're licensing. You know, so you have some control over what you're licensing and what you're not licensing. Make that real crystal clear. And then what types of products that the art will be reproduced on. Uh, that would be good to know. But unfortunately, a lot of them don't know uh, who would be interested in it and where they might want to use it. Um, this may not really apply to most people, but you want to make sure that your artwork isn't being used in some negative way. You know, like saying you're using some nudes or something that was your artwork. You wouldn't want them to be used in a pornographic way or any way that would be degrading to the artwork or in any way that you wouldn't uh, be supportive of. So you can have uh, verbiage like that in your agreement. Could you, I guess, do you put in for a first right of refusal, I guess, on some things that would be? Because, yeah? Yeah, because I, I can see some of your artwork being for the end of the world, and you really don't want to have that be on the book cover for the 
Right. Maybe the world. Yeah, exactly. So it's hard to foresee all those instances, but if you can foresee some of them or, or, or put in the, uh, the kind of philosophy, philosophy of, of how you want to represent yourself, if you can get that in there, that, that's to your benefit. I've seen agreements that actually say the language is like any electronic form known today or invented in the future. I mean, they, <laughs> all these companies are covering their butt because... Yeah. Even all releases have about composite. Mm -hmm. you know I mean, you could, you know, use the body from one model to face on from another. You need to have the right, right, you know, from from both of those models. <coughs> right. I had a woman um, send me an email yesterday, and she wants to use my artwork on some cards. I forgot what they are, tarot cards or some type of cards that had like motivational things on them. And uh, she had made a sample. She grabbed, you know, something off my web page and made a sample to show her partner. And she wasn't intending on reproducing it, thank goodness. But she's going to come here tomorrow night. And we're going to talk about what she wants. And, uh, and she specifically said she wants to license my artwork for the, the cover of this card deck. Get a reading from her to see if it will be successful. There yeah. you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> But it's kind of amusing how I was putting together the seminar and licensing, and all of a sudden someone yeah. sent me an email yesterday saying, "Oh, I want to license your artwork." Yeah. <laughs> well, you put it out there. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, what you put your attention on can, you know, it was manifest in the cards. itself. <laughs> <laughs> it <was in> the <laughs> cards. <laughs> oh, okay. Here's a couple more. Um, the producers or publishers written agreement to put your copyright notice on every product sold. That's not really going to happen, but it's nice to think in these terms of what you're wanting and knowing what you're wanting before you sign and get involved in the agreement. The countries in which the products will be sold. You usually get that though if it's for editorial use. Mm -hmm. And that's a completely different fee structure. Yeah. And you'll get a you know a photographer's right. cut line. Yeah. Yeah, for photography you want like a not a buying line but a uh, yeah. cut line. editorial cut line. Yeah. 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 A period of time, how during which the time the company has to bring the product to market. Um, you know, some of these things, if you don't specify it, you know, 10 years from now, they start using your image and go, what? So you might want to put some time limiters in there, termination date for the agreement. Um, a statement saying that you can cancel the agreement if they don't abide by its terms or if they go bankrupt. Stuff. Wait a minute, back up. It, yeah. well, is there a hold harmless? I'm sitting where if the child swallows a product with your art on it? Yeah. <laughs> is that what that is basically? Is An it, indemnification yeah. clause yeah, which says harmless. that the company will protect you from any lawsuits that might arise from any of their business activities, mm -hmm. which in any way relate to products carrying your art. So, like, if someone looks at your image and they go insane, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they're not going to hold you personally responsible for it. It makes the kid hungry. And it needs it. What happens if you license your artwork to a company? They do not go out of business, but they sell the company to someone else. Do you specify that in the contract that you want to? Yeah, you should have that in your contract. So that's a good point. It wasn't there was a problem with a, uh, a company that would purchase, like if you saw your images in that company's bond, mm -hmm. now they own your images. Right. You know what I mean? And your agreements. Your but, but I guess you have to put it in place. Yeah, that's a good point. And, but if you have a termination date for the agreement, like two years, and it gets right. sold, then it would have to be renewed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you have a legal dispute and it's going to go to court, where would that court be? Would it be in Australia or would it be here? <laughs> so, that's a good point. Not right very right. All right. A specific statement of any non-refundable advance payment to be made to you against future royalties. And that brings up an interesting point that we went through in this contract was uh, they're going to be expending money in marketing my images. So they could say they're going to spend $50,000 
on travel fees, you know, flying around Europe showing my portfolio to try and sell it, and then they're going to deduct that from my future earnings. Uh, <laughs> a lot of them have that in there. That's yeah. The first thing it gets crossed out, though. That's, That's ridiculous. So, uh, yeah, it's something to think uh. about. And book publishers do that, too. Yeah. And then you're right to have their books audited at your own expense to make certain they have paid what is due to you. So these are some of the things that you need to think about and you'd like to have in your favor uh, and that you might cross out in their contract and try to rewrite. Uh, but a lot of times they have their standard contract and they may or may not be willing to change it. So you've got to decide what position you want to take on that. Um, this particular lawyer says never ever allow them to gain the copyright of any of your pieces of art. Never allow them to gain full and complete reproduction rights to any of your art. Never allow them to gain the right to sublicense your art to other companies without your having to approve and sign a specific sublicensing agreement. I mean, who would have thought of that? You license it to somebody and then they sublicense license it out. You never allow them to gain ownership of your original works of art as part of the licensing agreement. Now, I, I had an interesting situation uh, just last week. Uh, an art collector came to me and they had 13 original oil paintings and they wanted us to reproduce them. And uh, they brought them over and I said, well, do you have authorization from the artist for, to reproduce these? And they said, yeah, yeah, we do. And I said, well, I want to see it in writing. Good for you. And they produced it. <laughs> Good. And the artist allowed, allowed them to reproduce like one set of, uh, of them and what their intention is to put the originals in a vault and then have the reproductions hanging in their office. I bet the artist really appreciated you doing that. Yeah, well he's in Europe someplace, so, uh, <laughs> you know, but through the art dealer, you know, they had, and they said that they always do that when they buy artwork. They have quite an extensive art collection and they always work that into the agreement that they have the right to reproduce it for their own purposes. And they don't intend to sell them, they just want to keep the originals in the vault have them in their home or their office where they won't get stolen. Some of them are, you know, $15,000. Because you could be liable, right? If you produce yeah. something that they don't have right to produce, it, it could come back to haunt you. per piece. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, I was very worried about that. And I wanted to see it writing. I would too. But not everyone is like me that respects the rights of artists. And a lot of people don't even know to ask the question, you know. Right. What to keep in mind, oh, when you're creating your artwork for licensing, there are certain formats and colors and things that you need to take into account if you want to make it more sellable in the licensing market. And the most acceptable format is a 3 to 4 ratio, such as 24 to 36 or 18 to 24, or other multiples up or down from that. If you do it in that size, then they can switch out another piece of artwork and throw yours in it easily if it's a design page, a printed page, or a website, or wherever it appears. Um, that's like the standard size. So um, if you paint it in the standard format, and it can be cropped for specific, then it can be cropped for specific uses. If you're painting something round or some odd shape, um, it's very difficult for them to use it you know, on a product. So it says you can pretty much assume that using a standard 3 to 4 ratio will increase your chances of licensing hard by a factor of 10. Kind of hard to see here, but in the background it's a 3 to 4 ratio. <laughs> Alright, so keep it flat if you're a 3D artist, like a sculptor. Um, that's hard to reproduce in the licensing market. So what you want to do is... Um, have a digital capture of it, and that's one of the things we do here. We'll digital, digitally capture a, a 3D piece and make it into a 2D uh, file that can be used for licensing. Color, uh, color trends for, there, there's a, a group of people who decide what the colors are going to be for next year. It's kind of an odd concept, mm -hmm. but that's actually the way it works. There's a group of people who decide, okay, next year colors are going to be blah, 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 blah. And then, even though it seems kind of goofy, um, it 
put some order into the whole area where now the, the fashion designers can go off and make their designs using that color palette, and interior designers, everyone involved in that industry can kind of agree that, okay, this is going to be what we're going to promote, you know, in our advertising. Paint companies that make the paint for painting your walls are going to use these basic colors. So every year they come out with a new color scheme um, for that season. And this is the spring and summer of 2013. So um, you might want to kind of get in tune with that if you want to license your artwork and be successful. And you can get this on the internet, see what the colors are going to be for the next season. Or you can go to visit some stores and see what they're using now. Usually the, the consumer lags a, a year or two behind you know, what, what's being promoted. So you can look in the stores today and see what's popular. Um, I did that when the when the brown and blue was very popular like five or six years ago. Oh, it became the brown and the green, you know, a variation of that. Uh, and I started creating pieces with those colors and then in doing that they fit more in more people's homes that way. Rather than just arbitrary colors out of my mind, you know. So if you're interested in licensing your artwork, you might want to take that into account. Uh, creating all, an overall mood. Now, most of us aren't particularly fans of Thomas Kincaid, but <laughs> he's one of the most successful artists in terms of money making of all time and, and in terms of licensing. And the point being made here is that in creating an overall mood, if you look at any portion of this piece, it, it carries the mood throughout the whole thing. It isn't just something going on in the center. It actually carries out through every portion of the image. And the licensing people like that. It makes for uh, looking better on, on products. It makes it more interesting and keep, it captures your interest. There's always you know, some little detail that you can look at here that still captures your interest with the same mood wherever you look. And this next artist is another very, very popular artist in terms of licensing, Mary oh, yeah. Engelbright. Yeah. And the same thing applies here. I mean, it's, this is the, like the main area, but if you look here, there's lots of detail. and kind of this whole feel is carried throughout the whole image. So you want to create an overall mood and, and keep it consistent throughout the whole piece. Each of these artists is fantastically successful and one of the most basic reasons for the success is their ability to design an overall and complete setting for the focus of their art. So remember, plan out your composition and take it all the way out to the edges of that three to four rectangle. So, I mean, some people might say, my God, that's awful limiting, you know, I'm, I'm selling out if I, you know, create mine in three to four every time, you know, and, that, and licensing may not be for you, <laughs> but if you want to sell broadly to the general public, you know, you have to take these things into account, and the more you follow these basic guidelines, the more successful you'll be, uh, because you fit what they're looking for. You can get rejected just like that because you don't have the right ratio. And it may be the most beautiful artwork and have great potential, but if it doesn't fit their standard formats, um, it could get rejected out of hand just like that. Create art in sets of four images. They want to see collections. The same is true for stationery, giftware, wall decor, and home decor companies. Um, they can't design the products around one image. And they want it in. And if it sells well, they want to have more depth. They want to have more add-on products to sell. Scott, yeah. when you're talking image, does that also apply to theme? Is that is that what you're saying? Theme? Yeah, like for example, yours is about a boat. Does that yeah. mean all of them should be a boat, or all of them should reflect something that is in the first image? Well, they should go in style, in the same style, uh, basically, whether it be color or theme. I mean, there are many ways of making a collection. You know, but they should be able to look good on the wall together, you know, or separately. So it doesn't have to be uh, an exact, almost mirror image of the first one. Then. No, no. It just has to go together as a set. You know, can you envision buying a set of four of these and hanging them in the same home or in the same room or on the same wall? Or, you know, if you're looking at products, would it look good on the shower curtain, on the floor mat, yeah. and on your, your cup, you know? <laughs> I notice also that when you're doing licensing, you're not watermarking the front. 
Is that correct? No. No, no, it's not correct or no. <laughs> you mean a watermark? You mean like a, a your copyright name. symbol? Yeah, or your copyright name or and your name or your name on the front? It depends. Um, they would prefer not to have to do that. If you're really famous and they demand it, then they'll do it. But if you're not famous, they may not okay. put your copyright or your name on it. I mean, ideally, you know, you want that. But you may not be able to get that. <laughs> who you're talking to, who their business practices are. Are you famous yet, Scott? In my mind, I am. <laughs> <laughs> you're selling it you're on all you these think. sites, you know. <laughs> Some people think I am. <laughs> I'm getting known. I've done a lot of art festivals around the country. And I've had people uh, you know, drive from Miami to come here and pick, up, you know, pick out a piece of artwork. Nice. Been recognized in the store a couple of times <laughs> nice. because I do outdoor art festivals and people have seen me. Cool. So some people think I'm, I'm famous. <laughs> have a clear focal point. Studies in the advertising industry have shown that you have about an eighth of a second to attack the eye of a viewer. Then the viewer looks elsewhere when they're looking back if there's something compelling, some visual focal point that draws the viewer's eye back to the art. That isn't much time to create interest in your art. It has to have immediately. It has to have immediately impact. That doesn't really quite really well, but immediate. Immediate yeah. impact. Um, I think the point's made. I'm not going to belabor that. I have a clear focal point. Um, create something that people want to look at again and again. How do you do that? You can go to your local mall and look at giftware stores and collectible stores and places that sell prints and posters and see what they're selling. And uh, you can get an idea of what they're buying. And if you're like totally, completely different, it's going to be a harder sell. Uh, it's kind of like when they, they make cars and they design cars. You don't see wildly dramatic changes in the car styling when you're going a lot because you know they have to sell them. They have to have a guaranteed number of units that sell. So if they go really wacky on it, um, it's concept car, they can do that, but something they're in production on, they have to be guaranteeing that they're going to sell it because they're investing a lot of money in it. So if you see what's already selling, you get an idea of what they're buying now. And if you can do something a little bit different, but not completely different, uh, you'll have more chances of selling it. Doesn't that tend to also be regionalized? Like you're not going to be really successful selling boats in Santa Fe? True. <laughs> True. <laughs> and vice versa. There is a regional factor for sure. Although there are a lot of people traveling, sort of, you get a real mix of, of people from all over the country. But uh, you do sell a lot of fish artwork and boat artwork in Florida for sure. So these are some of the art licensing agents in the U.S. This is just a partial list I found on the internet of about 50 of them. And you can approach these people and um, send them some images and they'll be interested in seeing them and seeing if there's a match or not. So you're going to put all this information on the web so we can download it? You can well, Google you it. Well, you probably won't be able to read this in the video on the web, but <laughs> just Google you can that. Just Google that. Yeah. Use art licensing agents. Yeah. yeah. So one thing you can do is you can look at some of these and see what they're what they're promoting and, and selling. And if you get on in there and you're a photographer and you see all these you know cutesy childish type of sketches, you know, then that may not be the right licensing agent for you. You want to kind of fit in and see you know, who they're selling to and what styles they're promoting. And then if it looks like there's a reasonable match, then you can contact them. Got it. So Surtex is the big daddy show in New York City for the licensing industry. And it's held once a year, and I've been to it. And it's devoted to selling, licensing, original art, and design for all types of products. And it draws designers from all over the world to New York City, and they can go and see. And each artist will have their own little booth and show their stuff. Wow. And, uh, 
I was frankly a bit disappointed because I was hoping to see some photography there, and I, I don't think I saw any photography there. It was mostly uh, these types of designs for gift wrap, you know, and, and various packaging things. And, um, I mean, there were some things there, but a lot of it was uh, these types of designs and what they uh, trying to do is create a design that can be like repeatable. Yeah. Yeah. Textiles. Yeah. And there's kind of an art to be able to create that so that it could like continue on infinitely. But I wanted to mention that because this is the big licensing show of the world pretty much. In New York City at the Javits Center every year. Why there was little photography there? Yeah, I know. I was just going out I got excited when I was in New York and the show was there and I went to it. But you know, they have their own type of industry niches and things. Is there a question? What is the cost of exhibiting a show like that? I'm not sure, but I have done some shows in the Javits Center and it'd be like, you know, $2,500, $3,000. And then of course it's a lot more than that because you've got to ship all your stuff up there and right. hotel. Yep, it's expensive. Good. Yeah, union labor. You can't just throw up your own light and have an electrician put the light up for you. All right, now this is interesting. There are these online retailers that are popping up all over the place. And this is one well-known one called Deny, D-E-N-Y. And uh, they have a lot of independent artists showing their work on there. And they can be put on pillows and duvet covers and shower curtains and all those examples we saw before. And they've got the relationship worked out with one of those companies like I mentioned in South Carolina <coughs> with this printing on demand and they can have an order for one pillow and this company will print the design on the pillow, sew up the pillow and ship it off to the customer. And Deny takes most of the money and the artist gets some money. I don't know what the percentage is or how that works out. But this is becoming uh, a new way of doing business, and they're putting some of the big box stores out of business by, by doing this. And they'll what kind of stores? Box stores, you know, like the typical like Walmart or not Walmart, Walmart, but yeah. Costco. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. right. right. Yeah, and there used to be like Bradley's and these big stores, right. you know. And they're tending to, to go by the wayside because of online retailers like this. And they're creating, they're, here you have the opportunity to get something very, very creative. You know, right. A lot of different, art, there are hundreds of artists <laughs> represented here. Right. And any one of these, you can see that on a shower curtain or a duvet cover right. or whatever. So it's actually very exciting for the consumer and for the artist to get global exposure and have this manufacturer be able to produce it within a few days and ship it off to the client. Right. And on demand. Right. It's wow. unbelievable. It's amazing. And these can be printed on the fabric or they can actually be sewn now and they'll have like a sewing machine with. 1,026 different colors in it and be able to actually sew yeah. the pillow. Wow. Wow. Your design on it. This stuff can you do? You showed us the print that I guess is being passed around. Can you do other things? I mean, that looks like that could be turned into a pillow. Yeah, I currently do not do fabric printing. That particular uh, method is called dye sublimation. And uh, I do not have any dye sublimation printers, but what it does is it prints on a transfer paper. And then they put it face down on the fabric and put it in a heat press. Wow. And then heat causes the, uh, the dyes to migrate, it vaporizes and penetrates the, the material. Um, and that's what that is. And that's dye sublimation. Wow, the colors are incredible. And I created that with the in mm -hmm. possible intention of making a pillow out of it as a sample. Yeah. Well, isn't that how they do the t shirts? A lot of them. But, direct but they also have direct, direct to garment DTG right, yeah. printing. There's a big show in Orlando every year, I think it's in February, called Infographics. Graphic, yeah. Infographic Expo. You can get in there, I think for free, if you're a designer or anything like that, and you can see all these things at work. They have big, big booths. And, but you're right, it's mostly textiles and the Carolinas and George and stuff like that, where it's all being produced. Yeah. 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 They've got the labor to sell and pack and right. try. So, um, if I didn't have all these other things going on, I'd probably check this out and try it. Mm. Alright, so what is the process of licensing? 
Well, you find... Um, wait, wait, wait. Hmm? You wait, <laughs> saying, wait, wait. So you find a company or you, you find an agent and then you're submitting some, some artwork to them and then you're waiting and, and then um, they find someone who's interested and they're showing it to buyers and, and then they wait for the buyer to make a decision and decide that they want to see some samples and so they make up some samples and look at the samples and then finally they decide to make out a purchase order and buy a thousand pillows or whatever it is. And then it takes weeks or months to you know, produce them and ship them. But you're pretty much looking at a like a year or sometimes even more process since you're submitting the artwork. Hmm. So it's not uh, that quick buck that you're hoping for you know, and hoping that you're going to get discovered and make a ton of money right off the bat. It's usually a long process. Not that it has to be, but that's typically what happens. Yeah, because if, when you think about it and if you get familiar with it, what happens, you're, Getting your art to somebody, and then they got to get excited about it, give it to their sales, and then the salesman goes out and knocks on doors and tries to get somebody interested, and they're saying, "Oh, well, maybe next year, you know, our fall collection might be able to use this." And then you're competing against a lot of other people, and then they got to make the decision, then put in the orders. It's a long, drawn-out process. Except for that online retailer, where that deny thing, you know, where you submit the image, and they can have it manufactured in three days. That's a whole nother. Uh, arrangement than working with the, uh, the big companies or with the uh, art reps. So, how are, are you going to read this for me? Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> so, how are the images chosen? Well, it's depending upon the use. Uh, for home decor, art directors you know, look at the fashion and design industry closely to be on top of the color and style trends of fashion. And last season's fashion tells you the colors for art the next season. Um, and they oh. want a line, a selection of artwork that can be pieced together. Like we're saying, you want a collection of like four pieces or more.